join us today. Okay. Welcome everybody. Let me be official because we're recording. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Um, before I introduce myself, please let us know in the chat here on Zoom or in Facebook. Uh, let us know where you're joining us from, your organization, and you know one thing that you're looking forward to um, from this important conversation today. Um, hi, I'm Idaki Yapi, Melissa Buffalo, Imachi Yapi A. Um, hello, again, my name is Melissa Buffalo. I am a citizen of the Meskwaki Nation in Iowa. I'm also Dakota from the Crow Creek and Lower Bill Sioux tribes in South Dakota. I am the Chief Executive Officer with the American Indian Cancer Foundation. And next month, I will have been with ACAF for five years, which is crazy and amazing. Um, I'm also a mom of two, which is my other full-time um, job. And we call home Minneapolis. I'm sure like many of you um, in this work around cancer and cancer inequities, it's just not a nine to five for us. It's something that we also have a personal commitment to. Um, just quickly to share that ACAF is a national nonprofit that was established to address the tremendous cancer inequities faced by Native communities. Our mission is to eliminate the cancer burdens of Indigenous people through improved access to prevention, early detection, treatment, and survivor support. Please visit AmericanIndianCancer.org for more information, and I think we'll try and put some of those links to the pages um, for some of our colorectal cancer resources throughout the webinar. Um, as well as some of our panelists. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today to host an essential conversation on colorectal cancer, you know, in Indian country and, you know, what a path forward to closing that gap could look like and, you know, being honest with that conversation. Um, and so as we get into this conversation, again, I want to thank our staff who, you know, work together to put these questions and this script and panel. I want to thank our sponsor, our, um, our, not our sponsors, our panelists for being here and then all of you who are joining us. Um, I just want to give you the quick goals um, for today is to understand current Indigenous colorectal cancer data, to recognize how the cancer continuum plays a role in Indigenous um, colorectal community health, um, to learn how short-term and long-term colorectal cancer goals can positively impact Indigenous health outcomes, and lastly, to distinguish actionable steps in reducing the incidence of colorectal cancer um, within our communities. And before we get to our panelists, we want to set the stage by sharing and, you know, kind of going over some of the data that we have pulled together and having this short presentation. Then we'll go into a short presentation from our panelists. Um, from there, we'll go into some Q&A with our panelists. And then I'm hoping at the end, we will have some time to answer questions from our audience. Please make sure you're both um, putting questions in the chat on Zoom and in Facebook. We want to make sure we get to those. Um, and again, welcome everybody if you're joining us. And so today, colorectal cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer for Indigenous people. And for us, it's really alarming because when colon cancer rates have only slowly decreased for our relatives compared to rapidly decreasing um, for non-Hispanic white individuals. And so throughout this conversation today, again, we invite all of you to challenge your awareness of the issues around col that colorectal cancer faces, you know, in your community and how we can all support one another in working to close that gap. Um, and, you know, within your community and just, you know, in general, Native communities as a whole and just understanding, you know, together that we are stronger. Um, let me introduce our panel and then we'll go into the PowerPoint. So first we have Dr. Loretta Christensen, who is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and serves as the Chief Medical Officer of the Indian Health Service. Um, IHS, an agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, is the principal federal health care provider for American Indians and Alaska Natives. As the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Christensen is IHS's lead expert on medical and public health topics, providing technical consultation and guidance to the IHS Office of the Director and IHS staff throughout the country on American Indian and Alaska Native health care policies and issues. Um, next, Dr. Diana Redwood is a senior epidemiologist at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. She has worked um, in the Alaska Tribal Health System since 2004. You know, her expertise is in public health and epidemiology with a focus on cancer screening and prevention. She is the program director for a CDC funded colorectal cancer control program grant that works to increase colorectal cancer screening within the Alaska tribal health systems. 
She also conducts research into novel methods of colorectal cancer screening outreach and new screening methods for the Alaska Native population. Um, her research has focused on the use of stool DNA tests, which is Cologuard, again, for improving screening, including Cologuard effectiveness, patient and provider perspectives on the test and its cost effectiveness within the Alaska tribal health systems. Um, our final panelist is Beth Seeloff. Beth is a public health specialist in cancer prevention and control program manager at the Intertribal Council of Michigan and supports the Anishinaabe health systems across the Great Lakes. Beth is a member of the University of Michigan Rogel, I hope I said that right, Cancer Center, Community Advisory Board, and the Michigan Oncology Quality Control, the Michigan Cancer Consortium, and served on the George Washington Cancer Center Comprehensive Cancer Control Technical Awareness and Training Steering Committee. She's a very busy woman, we all are. <laughs> so Beth is dedicated to ensuring Native Americans have the most accessible and evidence-based screening and treatments for disease prevention. She has collaborated with local, state, and national organizations to eliminate barriers to care across the cancer continuum. Again, her efforts and guidance are directly attributed to the uptake in colorectal cancer screening rate for the Three Fire Cancels Consortium and the Tribal Colon Cancer Screening Project. And just, you know, very thankful that all of them, you know, work with us and, you know, the work we do to support each other in addressing the disparities. I'm um, again, want to extend a warm welcome to all of our panelists for being here today. Um, as I mentioned, I'd like to take a few minutes to set the stage for this conversation today and lay the foundation. Um, um, and lay the foundation for colorectal cancer throughout Indian country. So we started sharing our screen. Give me one second, because I know I lost the PowerPoint on my end. Oh, Lindsay, I lost it on my end. Give me one second. Okay. So colorectal cancer data in American Indian Alaska Native communities. Um, next slide, please. So again, this presentation focuses mostly on the incidence data as there are limitations to publicly available mortality data for American Indian and Alaska Native communities with racial misclassification issues and deaths not being linked to IHS records in the same manner as incidence data. So again, as I shared, um, colorectal cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer among our relatives. It is the second most common among Alaska Natives. You know, rates of CRC diagnosis and mortality are higher among American Indian Alaska Native people compared to non-Hispanic whites. But again, that varies regionally. We know there's limitations with publicly available CRC mortality data for American Indian Alaska Native communities. And we know that our relatives are less likely to have CRC diagnosed in early stages when it is when it might be easier to treat. Um, next slide. Again, what are some of those risk factors for colorectal cancer? Low physical activity, smoking, alcohol use, high consumption of red and processed meats, um, being overweight or obese, having a family or personal history of colorectal cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, being over the age of 50, and then certain inherited syndromes. Um, next slide, please. And so looking at this graph um, shows a five-year incidence rates of colorectal cancer um, for American Indian Alaska Native people, which is the gray pink bars living in the IHS purchase referred care delivery areas, you know, again, compared to non-Hispanic white people, which is the red bars. You know, in these areas, you can see the highest rates um, are in Alaska with 90 cases of colorectal cancer um, diagnosed per 100,000 people. And then the rates are the lowest in the south, at, southeast and east regions. And again, just looking at this visual just shows how much variation there is by region. Um, next slide. Um, so this graph shows that when looking at differences by sex for the same time period and across all, I, all IHS regions, colorectal cancer rates are higher among men, which is the dark red bars, for both AI, for both American Indian Alaska Native and white individuals, but the rates are higher for American Indian Alaska Native people still overall and highest among our um, 
Alaska Native and American Indian men. Um, a few more slides. Next slides, please. Um, so looking at this trend graph, we can compare how the CRC incident rates have changed over time. The blue and gray lines represent American Indian and Alaska Native men and women, respectively, while the green and purple lines represent non-Hispanic white men and women. You can see that from time periods 1999 to 2015, rates have decreased more slowly among American Indian and Alaska Natives, um, again, compared to whites. While these are combined incidence rates, again, we would see variations in trends by region. Next slide, please. Again, regular screening is recommended for all individuals ages 45 through 75 who are asymptomatic and of average risk. Data from the National Health Interview Survey reveals that only 56% of Native men and women of screening age reported being current with colorectal cancer screening compared to 69% of white men and women. Um, next slide. Um, these screening rates are even lower when looking at IHS colorectal cancer screening GIPRA rates, which have hovered around 30% and not improved when looking at the most recent um, four years worth of data. Um, next slide. That one was really fast. Um, and just this last slide again, finally, when looking at the data, it's important that we consider that early onset colorectal cancer is on the rise. You know, early onset cases are those occurring in people ages 20 to 49. You know, increases in diagnosis are occurring among this age group despite overall declines in CRC incidence rates. This has contributed to the recommendations to lower the starting age of screening from 50 to 45 in recent years. We also see that early onset colorectal cancer incident rates are increasing among, increasing faster among American Indian Alaska Native people compared again to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and then our last slide just sh kind of shows how to connect with us, but we can save that one for the end. Again, this was a lot of information, so please, um, hopefully we can put this on our website with the information and then even have some conversation from our presenters again, panelists again today. Um, and so one question I have for all of our panelists is, um, oh, no, just kidding. Um, wanting all of you to share or describe the communities you serve. So if we can start with Dr. Redwood. Sure, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Um, I serve at the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and we actually are uh, uh, multiple or tribal health organizations around the state are represented in my organization. And each regional tribal health organization serves the people and communities within their area in Alaska. So I often say I serve the entire state and we work directly with different organizations um, down straight down to going door to door in communities. So all, all over Alaska. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Christensen. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so for us, we serve 37 states and approximately 1.7 million direct service um, American Indian Alaska Native populations. However, if you total the um, tribal organizations and urban sites, it's about 2.8 million. Um, my philosophy is I serve everyone in the American Indian Alaska Native population, but we are quite vast. Uh, we have 12 areas that we use to regionally um, work with our tribes and our urban centers, as well as our direct services. So um, it's a big job, but it is very important and the most important job to us at the IHS. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Christensen and Beth. Thank you. Melissa, um, I have the honor of serving the 12 federally recognized tribes located in the state of Michigan. There are seven tribes in the lower peninsula of Michigan. So if you look down at your right hand and you'll see the mitten, those tribes begin at the lower left hand side of your hand on the Indiana border and go all the way up to the tip of your middle finger there in the lower peninsula. And then if you take your left hand and put it on top of the right. We have um, five federally recognized tribes there. Uh, the tribes in the UP are in a very austere rural environment. 
Um, we serve 60, we have service area of 63 rural counties that we support um, American Indians and Alaska Native clientele that are um, direct care clients of the tribal um, health systems. And the health systems vary in size from a patient population of 900 to a patient population of 15,000. So we have a very broad view and I'm very honored that I get to support them in, in this capacity. So thank you. Thank you for that, Beth. Um, and so now we'll kind of move and shift into some of those presentations. We'll start with Dr. Christensen, who is pleased to share about um, IHS's multidisciplinary cancer program that is being developed for the agency. And again, additionally, she will be sharing on the president's um, cancer moonshot and how they have focused on prevention and early diagnosis, including community-based colorectal cancer screenings. And then lastly, um, launching their first IHS patient navigator training focused on cancer navigation. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Christensen and she will be sharing her screen. Okay, let's just get set here. There we go. Okay, I'm assuming everyone can see the screen. Thank you so much. Um, so very honored to be here. Yet a to everyone. Um, as was said, I'm Dr. Lloyd Christensen, a member of Navajo Nation, and uh, I grew up in the Southwest portion in a border town of of uh, the Navajo Reservation. So um, I, I want to just really emphasize a lot of the things that Melissa uh, spoke of before. We know this is a huge problem. We know it, it seems to be very much increasing. We haven't made much ground in decreasing the numbers and the cases are being diagnosed at a much earlier age. Um, so it is something very important in American Indian Alaska Native populations. So in uh, 19, and um, I'm, I'm back in the 1900s, in the 2023, the IHS convened a workforce of multidisciplinary teams, and we wanted to put a roadmap together and establish our strategic priorities and activities. Um, using the resources that are available to, I think we've done a great job. Um, we've had a lot of partners in this effort. We invited... Um, uh, the academic centers, the CDC, others, because we know this isn't just one person's responsibility or one agency's responsibility. It's all of our responsibility to participate. Um, you know, the American Indian Cancer Foundation has been a great partner to us, and, and we really appreciate all the work and sharing that they do with us, and we hope we are also being supportive as well. But we want to really look at, this is our, our continuum of care that we put together, and we should be putting out our formal plan in the next few months of how we want to do this and what we need to cover. This is a really nice integrated diagram of everything that's necessary. Um, it's built upon looking at the center of this to be, of course, our patients always. Um, some of the things that are important with the um, cancer moonshot and the work we've done with the White House is to really map this out and, and share with them what we're doing and what we feel we is very effective in Indian country because it has to be culturally appropriate and it has to be delivered in a way that's meaningful to the people that we serve. There's a lot of cross cutting areas in there, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but the things I wanna bring is the red at the bottom of the screen is early detection and screening. I, I am a um, general surgeon by training and so I spent a lot of time on the late on, on this type of work, and I certainly rather pick it up here in early detection and screening than I would to have to operate. And, and surgeons love to operate, but when it's for cancer, we would rather pick it up, cure it at the, the lowest state. And we do know we are diagnosed at later stages in American Indian Alaska Native population, which makes the treatment more harsh and more intense than if we could pick it up in the early stages, and and we'd have a very good. Um, response rate to treatment in those earlier stages. So some of this has to be done in a facility. Um, of course, you know, you need a mammogram machine, although there are mobile units um, and our, you know, our cervical cancer screening, et cetera, are, are usually done more in our healthcare clinics and facilities. However, and we're gonna talk about this, colorectal cancer does have a component that can be very well addressed in the communities. I don't, I want to really emphasize equally important with these screenings is education community-based education for every one of our communities to communicate the risk, what to look for. 
why screening is important. This is, this is the basis and foundation for everything we do. So this is vitally important as we move, move forward with our work. Um, we do still report up to the cancer moonshot. Um, and I will say though, as much as I appreciate that and appreciate how important it is across the country, this will remain important to us no matter what. It is not gonna drop off. It's not related to anything to do with um, the political side of the world. It's really about taking really good care of our, of our people. So community-based colorectal screening. We did three pilots very early in, in uh, near the 2021 time. And it had three service units that we did uh, do, what can we do out in the, in the communities? So we did Colorado River Service Unit and it was a clinic-based project in 2019 where we distributed the kits to patient, did presentation, health fairs, mass mailings to encourage screening. We did see a good 5% in, increase and, and we, were, we were conversing before this started. That is still not good enough. I don't want you to say, hey, yay, we hit 40 and we're done. We want to get everybody screened. So our goal is always 100%. But I'm going to say just doing these things, we found, we're finding ways to make it, I always say, more better. So um, at Gallup Indian Medical Center, fantastic project out of the Navajo area office working with the center. They, we used our, the contact tracers that were help, so helpful during the pandemic. And they were trained on how to do um, colorectal screening interchanges with the, with the uh, patients out in the field. So we had, you know, their dialogue, we taught them about the screening, how to use the kits and all this in, in conjunction with some of our primary care doctors. And they did these follow-ups where they basically walked the patient through. Are you having any problems? Call us if you're confused. This is what you do. Followed up, did you send your kit back in? And they had a 67% return of kits. This was an amazing, and, and my shout out to that group that did this, and they're continuing it to it. They're rolling it out to other service units in Navajo um, beyond the pilot because we want to make it standard practice. We don't want to say, hey, we did a great pilot. We want it standard practice. And then we had the Indian Family Health Clinic of Great Falls, same thing. They did fit kit handouts, screening reminders, handoffs with the patients, and they were able to get almost a 40% return. And that's still, if you look at it, we're making progress. So we were so encouraged by these pilots that we decided, okay, can we do another three pilots? And then we had requests for even more, which is awesome, because that means we have the engagement of the staff in the field. So we did, we started a new round and this was Cass Lake. They targeted 45 to 75. They did chart reviews to see who needed to be followed up. They did postcard reminders to patients, a letter step-by-step. Step. Um, and they, you know, this was a modest increase, but they actually found some things they could do better. Like you try something and say, okay, this doesn't work in this community. Maybe they like to be communicated to in a different way. So this is still ongoing and they're making changes. And I know that number is going to be even greater. So that was a good job by Cass Lake. So we have Mescalero, which is in the Albuquerque area, same, same basic age group. They ordered the kits at and gave them out at clinics, community events, warm handouts, outreaches to our elder centers to teach, to educate, and distribute. They work with wellness center staff, again, for the same things. They really hit it from every single direction. Um, and they played constant videos because we do use some videos in our waiting room where we try to transmit good healthcare information. And they did get a good 3% increase almost right away. So that's encouraging. They're continuing to do this. I think we're going to, again, have um, even more increase in that. So that's our second one. And um, oh, I seem to have lost one of mine along the way. Okay. Well, we had three. Um, I'll read that one to you because somehow that dropped off the slides. Um, and we had a, another one in Wewoka service unit, which rolled out a pilot project with diabetes patients in the 45 to 75. So they looked out to see, okay, we have you here. We have you here for your diabetes. Let's see what else you need, which is what we want every single time. When you have a patient in front of you is the time. Are you vaccinated? Have you got your screenings? Do you need something? Are you having challenges that we can when help you with, along with other screening that should be going on? So they, they are developing a colorectal survivor video that they can say, hey, this is somebody who caught this and this is what happened to them for the for throughout. 
So they did this and they had um, educational materials adapted to their communities, did follow-ups for positives to make sure they were getting into care. And they had a really nice increase of over 12% just in the early stages of their pilot. So we have some amazing work going on. The, the, the goal for all of this is once we take these six pilots, what were the best practices? What can we then spread across the agency? So everyone is doing this community-based testing. I do want to tell you, of course, if it's positive, a colonoscopy will follow this, and that should be contacted with our um, uh, closest endoscopy services. And that is part of the program, too, is we do the first screening. Uh, people are negative. We say, okay, you're not done for life. You have to keep getting screened. And if something is suspicious or indistinct or undecisive, we, we do further studies to, to um, take care of these people. As, as Melissa alluded to, we have cancer navigators. Uh, our first program, it will be launching very soon in 2024. It is culturally appropriate. It, it was developed with tribal communities in mind. So this is a very specific, I think, very important training. And you're, who are we training? Well, we're training community health representatives, any community health aides. And we have a new category called public health aides that work in all domains of public health. So we are widely training. My, my theory is, is that people will find the area that means something to them. We're starting with cancer, of course. This is vitally important. But they may decide they want to navigate for maternal child health or for behavioral health. And that's okay. It's the skills in helping patients walk through a program. You know, it's scary. You say cancer to anyone in this country and they, st they can't even hear you anymore. So you have to have a very methodical way to educate, to ensure that they get help for appointments, getting their labs done, making sure they went to their appointments. And you know, the other thing I worry about very much is when people don't hear anything, they say, okay, I must be okay. They often won't call and say, because then, then they might get an answer they don't want to hear. So they just say, hey, the doctor didn't call me. I'm good. No, we're teaching the, our, our population to say, you get that result. If it's negative, great. If it's not, we need to get you in the system. But avoiding that question, we can't do that. We have to help our patients that, that fear that, that they don't want to maybe know that we have to help them through that, because that's so vitally important to get into care right away. Okay, there it is. Okay, I knew I had it in there somewhere. Okay, we went through that one. Okay, so what I, I, I wanna close out with, cause we could talk about this all day and I'm happy to answer questions, is that for those of you who don't know what PRC is, it's purchase, Purchased Referred Care. It is appropriated money that all of us get, tribal, everybody, to take care of care we're not able to provide at our facilities. So if you need, intense cancer therapy, we will use this funding to get you where you need to go to do your treatment. We recently updated this for the first time in 25 years. And so we have a brand new PRC priority list for, for, med for decision making. And you can see here, here we go again, we're integrating everything. Everything is equal. And you see there on the left side, preventative and rehabilitative. That is as vitally important as the medical dental, the maternal child health, and the behavioral health. These are all core needs of our people. And so we have now created that equity to where prevention is an afterthought. It's a, it's a primary thought of how we set. So if, say for example, I need to get someone in for a mammogram and that hospital has no appointments for three months. Well, that's not good enough. You can now go to another place, private sector, and get your mammogram and we would pay for it through PRC because we want you to get that screening real time. This is including um, lung cancer screening, colorectal screening and or colonoscopy, mammograms, anything that we can't get in with a reasonable amount of time. We now have the ability as a core service to our people to get them to that preventive care. So I'm very excited about this because I think all this intersects and supports each other and each thing that we do. And you may need all of those four services around that circle for any one of these things that may be happening in your life. But we don't, we want to give the standard of care that everyone should have in this country to our American Indian Alaska Native population. So I just wanted to share that with you because I think that's very important to support all the efforts of the great 
speakers we have on today and panelists that we have on. And this is definitely a step forward in, in stopping things early and diagnosing people when it's very treatable. So thank you so much uh, for the time to speak about this. And I'm going to stop sharing and hand it back to Melissa. Uh, that was amazing, Dr. Christensen. I have a lot of questions, but I know this is not about me, so I will hold my questions. Um, and I love that preventative and that circle. I think about how many times I've had conversations with folks, you know, who haven't heard of IHS or have very limited knowledge and talking about primary care. And they're like, well, what does that mean? So to see the preventative care makes me really happy. Um, next, let's go to Dr. Redwood, who will also be sharing her screen and, you know, be sharing a couple slides about the Alaska Native Health Systems and the challenges within that geography. And then she'll also share their CRC program efforts and navigation, and then um, discussing some of her research projects that I um, lightly touched on. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Redwood. Thanks so much. And just confirming you're seeing my, my slides. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking the Denina people on whose traditional lands I live in South Central Alaska. Um, as shown here, this is actually from Bristol Bay area, um, but uh, Alaskans love our traditional activities, including picking berries and subsistence. So one of the reasons that we focus on colorectal cancer, though, is that as Melissa talked about the overall data, um, colorectal cancer among Alaska Native people is actually the highest in the world. So it's something that we, we really are concerned about, but it's also something that we can prevent and can work on. And so that's what we try to do. I put this uh, map up just because um, sometimes people forget Alaska is really big and our uh, Alaska Native healthcare system, this is our referral pattern. Um, we have a system that serves over 150,000 Alaska Native people and American Indian people who um, live in our state with us. And so it is um, widely dispersed and ours is basically we have small community clinics and then sub-regional clinics served by eight regional hospitals and then the only tertiary care center is here in Anchorage sort of the the um, center of our spoken hub that you can see there so it the high burden of colorectal cancer is actually impacted very much by this vast geography many communities are not on the road system and so um, they have to fly to get to cancer screening or if you need a follow up for a fit test to get to a colonoscopy. So this is a, a challenge for us. We, we continuously are trying to improve the work that we do. Um, and again, you know, if you're way out on the Aleutian chain and you have to fly all the way to Anchorage, it's a five hour flight. So if you think about that in terms of getting a colonoscopy, if you had to fly from New York to Miami to get your screening, you might um, be, be, be less inclined to do so. And by fly, I do mean fly. Um, as I said, most communities are not connected by road. Um, sometimes there's ice roads in winter or boat, but mostly people fly in small planes to get places. I mentioned earlier that we have a colorectal cancer control program, and this is funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we've been really excited to participate. This is our second time as one of the CDC grantees. And this time we're really focusing on improving screening within primary care clinics, um, trying to make sure that our, our um, electronic health records are up to date. Um, this is one of my, my certain things is that, you know, if you have providers, you want the providers doing the best evidence-based interventions, like recommending screening to patients that come in. But if the data isn't good in, in the medical record and they don't know if somebody's due for screening, then how can they give that strong recommendation? So we do a lot to try and um, implement um, screening methods and um, help people get, get screened at their clinics or um, at the regional hospitals. 
And a lot of that is through patient navigation and outreach. I would say that time and time again in tribal communities, having direct warm touch, somebody who speaks your language, who is from the community, uh, makes a big difference in whether they get screening. And, and for all of us, you know, it's something you don't do every day. You might not know what um, options are available. And so that can be a really important part is that person um, giving you a phone call who um, can help you through it. We also do a lot of community education, um, social media engagement, outreach, and we've been told by our elders committee and multiple community members that they prefer colorectal cancer information that is more lighthearted, that's more fun. It doesn't cancer, you know, the prevention of cancer can be exciting, it can be more lighthearted. They prefer it when it's not such a scary word. And so we've had a lot of work where we have tried to um, increase our screening uh, materials that have more of a lighthearted message and to get, get the word out. Along with our programmatic efforts, we also are doing uh, research uh, into um, colorectal cancer among Alaska Native people. And part of that is that, you know, it is higher among Alaska Native people. And yet, and we've actually been doing, I would say, an amazing job of getting people screened. Alaska Native people now have higher screening rates than non-Alaska Native people in our state. And that's a, a major accomplishment. And But it's still the mortality, incidence mortality are still high, they aren't declining the way they are in other populations. So we have this sort of strange puzzling conundrum that we're not seeing the same benefits. Um, part of looking at that, the in 2013, the Alaska Native Medical Center and, uh, and across our entire state decided to um, lower the screening rate or screening age for Alaska Native people to starting at age 40. So all Alaska Native people are recommended to screen at age 40 because of just those higher rates and especially higher at the younger age groups. But along with our program, as I said, we're trying to do research. So we're researching what are best ways to outreach to people, whether that's giant inflatable colons or improving our health education materials, what kind of screening methods are available? We have done work looking at use of the fecal immunochemical test, looking at the multi-target stool DNA test or Cologuard, just like how, how can we inc increase the methods that are available so that not everyone has to get a colonoscopy, which involves a lot of work and time and effort for, for all people. So um, we also are very interested in whether there's you know, what are the risk factors here in Alaska? Uh, Dr. Christensen talked about some of them and, and um, so did Melissa, but are there ones that are unique in Alaska? Are there things that are different? Um, are there difference in genetics? And so we don't know, and that's some of the things we're trying to learn more about. Um, are there things we can do with fiber supplementation? Are there differences in the microbiome um, and gut uh, microflora? So trying to do a lot in that area as well. An example of this was our randomized control trial of the stool DNA test. And this is one where we were doing a pre-processing lab here in Anchorage so that samples could come to us, get pre-processed and then shipped on for um, actual analysis. So really, again, we're just trying to figure out um, whether this test can work in the Alaska setting. And um, we're also trying to learn more about patient navigation or mailed outreach, whether that helps increase screening. So more to come, but I will say um, that I think it's really important in closing that it's that we work together to get people screened and increase our understanding of colorectal cancer in the Alaska Native population because we have this end goal to working to ensure that fewer Alaska Native people die from this preventable disease now and in the future. And with that, I'll say Kuyana, thank you, Gunashish, and I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Redwood. I took some notes and was thinking about, yeah, that mortality, but then the higher screening rates. And then again, emphasizing that the 40 year to be able to get screened at 40. Um, 
I like the question you asked about, you know, what are some of the best ways to outreach? And I want to encourage our attendees, if you have ways that you are outreaching to your community, please feel free to share that with us in the chat. I think, again, like we said, we've all want to work together. Um, and if you guys have ways that are working in your community, please let us know. Um, Beth, I you are our last um, presenter. Excited to hear about some of the work that you're doing in Michigan and sharing about some of the navigation and screening frequency. So with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Melissa. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to talk about the impact of rural um, screening disparities. We've, um, I think, um, Alaska experiences these great disparities and Oftentimes it's some, in some areas, it's very obvious, you know, what the barriers are, but I want to talk a little bit about more about what you can do and what um, has been successful for us, right? Um, because there is a scarcity, um, a scarcity of available screening resources. There's um, a wait list, right? Um, there's absence of timely cancer screening which equates to an increase of late stage diagnosis and cancer related deaths. And then we've also covered um, cancer prevention and survivorship outcomes, right? Um, are dependent upon access to care, health liter literacy and elimination of those structural barriers across the continuum of cancer. As you can see on this map, um, this is a Michigan map and you can do maps for your own states um, at ruralhealthinfo.org. And I overlaid in the, um, the red dots there so that they would be visible is where the approximate area of our um, 12 federally recognized tribes. And as you can see that um, they are pretty much all except for two in a health shortage area. And I can tell you the one at the top of the map right there in the light blue, um, they, while they're in, they are not in a shortage area, the wait time for a screening colonoscopy is now seven to eight months. So yeah, we have to look at everything. And while you may think, oh, we're in the clear, we're blue, we're great, right? No, it's it's there. And, and that's why um, I want to echo that it's important to look at um, screening opportunities is multidimensional, like, and that's educating our providers that there are, there is Cologuard, you know, there, there is the, there a variety of home screening tests that we can use to make sure, get people in the clear so that that available of health, availability of healthcare is there sooner, right? Um, the health literacy, um, you need to know your folks, right? You need to know your community members and, present, right, the values of these screenings in um, in a method that's ap approachable and understandable by them. Um, another factor that influence impacts um, the communities I serve, especially in the UP, is the presence of persistence poverty um, and absence of navigation support, travel distance to um, primary care providers, is often an hour or more and travel distance to screening and treatment facilities range anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes. And when you have persistent poverty, a long wait time and a long travel distance, that often equates to a, a very um, persistent barrier in screening. So navigation in rural communities, that seems to be um, the word of the day. And it really does make a difference. Um, we have used our tribal colon cancer screening grant funding and our breast and cervical cancer screening grant funding to pay for navigation in our tribal communities. And our colon cancer screening rates have um, skyrocketed from 40% to 67%. We have one clinic who is at 70%. And so 
Um, using these EBIs, I really want to say that the navigation and really following the evidence, right, and culturally tailoring it for your community is so important. Um, following up on patient reminders. We found a lot of folks, right, sending out a reminder, but once we started adding in text and phone call follow-ups, um, the screening rates improved. And building trust, right, using those community members, right, as Dr. Redwood said, like having someone from that community, you know, five years ago when I um, started on this journey, they always were prefacing the word navigation with a nurse, right? And we have found so many more opportunities with lay navigators, community health workers, and public health staff who are doing the navigation. And so they're not distracted and pulled away from these duties that they're truly just focused on understanding and supporting patients in the barriers to screening. Um, and, you know, we talk about transportation, right? Um, eliminating out-of-pocket costs. Um, many of you are um, colon cancer screening grant recipients in these um, utilizing out-of-pocket, eliminating the out-of-pocket costs by purchasing prep kits, fuel cards, using, um, purchase referred care funding for um, Coligard. Like it's it's all making a significant difference in our tribal communities. And again, the follow-up, right? And timely support for patients who require diagnostic follow-up. Like our navigators are working on the weekends, right? Looking, calling hospitals and finding those, no you know, those patients that um, cancel at the last minute and just really being innovative and on the ground running, trying to support their patients. And then most of all, our providers thank their patients for completing their screening and really emphasize that everyone in the community ma matters. And that seems to um, have improved our screening rates like because they feel that commitment to themselves, their provider, and most of all, their family members and community. So be supporting... I really like this slide. Um, it, it supports all the QI efforts and I wanna put um, a big plug in for supporting your staff. And I'm talking about everyone from the medical director all the way across the clinic to the um, receptionists and the schedulers and medical records in um, developing motivational interviewing skills and getting these trainings. We've have. We've had a very good um, partnership with the University of Michigan and the clinics can't say enough about this training. But as you see, this is um, just a little chart on supporting behavioral change in our rural landscape of Michigan and um, getting patients from that pre-contemplation stage to that uh, maintenance stage, whether it's an annual Coligard, an annual FIT, or you know that five-year maintenance plan um, via colonoscopy, right? And um, and we really want to ensure that there's trust, that patients are educated on on the purpose of these screenings, and that it's preventative, right? When we when we put that preventative word in front of it, that's where we see that big uptake because they're preventing something in its um, an easy way. Um, Another place is that uninsured and access to care, right? So we're taking down the barriers and we're ensuring that we try to get screenings on the weekends if we can. Um, we want to facilitate that patient provider communication and sometimes it's through the navigator and sometimes the navigators putting notes in the system and just asking the doctors to call and they do. And then like I said, with the appointment wait times and that patient provider communication, we get, there's a lot of action taken. And the, the interesting thing about this, and I didn't highlight it at, in the beginning is when we start missing these steps, and I'm sure you can all recall when you start missing, missing these steps, right? Preparing patients and taking action with them, and supporting their maintenance, then we kind of regress and we have to start over. So um, it's important to dedicate yourselves to doing that.
And I really like this slide. This picture is from another one of our cancer resources, but um, it just talks about the community, right? And setting yourself up for success. And you need team leads who support a team approach to wellness, right? And we want to, we've found the success in developing a schedule of program activities, right? Monthly reporting and use of quality improvement planning and standardizing the use of patient navigation services. And I want to um, really emphasize, because I find it very important, especially in tribal communities and especially in rural communities, is that it's a team approach, right? It's not just the providers and it's not just the navigator. It's everyone in the clinic understanding the disparity and knowing that they are a value and an integral part of eliminating this disparity. And through that, we can publicize our EBIs and evaluation strategies and publicize the success that the communities are having in getting this done. And then my last slide is just on how you can find us. And please don't hesitate to call. Our clinics that are having these great successes are more than willing to mentor others and support everyone else. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Beth. I love that supporting behavior change in rural landscape, kind of that flow chart you had. Um, from the pre-contemplation, that was just, I love it. And I could give you my personal experience, but we'll save that because I recently had a call <laughs> and I did everything to put it off. And this is someone who has access to care, but even had barriers. So um, yeah. this is wonderful. So we are at 1251. We have about 30 minutes for questions. And I'm seeing some really great questions from um, our attendees. So if that's okay, I'm going to give one of those questions and then we'll kind of go into some of the ones that we have, if that's okay with you all. Are we shaking heads? No. <laughs> um, the first one is, how can I access Navigator program curriculum? And I will open that to any of you. And that one came in, Dr. Christensen, at your when you were speaking. So I don't know if that. Yes. Um. Thanks for the question. There are several navigator programs across the country. The one that we're using is, um, just kicking off, but has been used primarily in the Southwest. Uh, so it was developed down in that area as as being culturally uh, sensitive and appropriate for the care. Um. I don't personally have the uh, curriculum, but I can put someone for you to contact if you want to have more conversation about that, and I'll put that in the chat. Um, so uh, our public health, my public health senior advisor is actually running that project and will be able to give you some further information about the program. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat for you. Um, I, I know the University of, oh. oh, sorry, go ahead, Beth. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the University of Colorado used to have a really nice patient navigation um, training and they they had like a manual. I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but I think they might be. And um, they came up, actually, a trainer came to Alaska and a lot of our patient navigators really benefited from having that um, that. I, I think, you know, it, it takes a certain type of person to do good patient navigation. You have to have that warmth, but also the nudge. And so helping people get more confident in those skills, I think, is really important. Whatever, um, you know, program you do or, you, or even just with each other, um, you know, practicing calling each other and, and inviting somebody to get their colon cancer screening and saying, you know, like some of the common barriers and walking through it, that can, even that can be really helpful with staff. And George Washington Cancer Center, they have a free um, online training. And then ACS just came out with a some um, virtual training also. And I think there's a fee for that one, but they're all very good and it, and it's just, they're all very good trainings and they're all unique for based on your needs. 
Awesome. Thank you for answering and providing that input. And so I'll go back to one of our questions in this one. Um, I'm going to move up as well. So for all of you, how do you envision prevention being a key piece in reducing the uptick of colorectal cancer? Well, I can certainly answer. Um, one of the things that we have done is can uh, partner with our the the Alaska branch of the American Cancer Society. Um, to Alaska is small, so we all know each other, but you don't always know what everyone's doing and how to all um, row in the same boat. So, what we have tried to work with them on some primary with prevention, and then also our comprehensive cancer control program that we have also at our organization. And so they have done a lot around traditional foods, encouraging um, traditional foods being first foods, um, physical activity promotion, um, tobacco cessation. And so I think that you know, more and more, we can't divorce screening. I, I've been personally very focused on screening, but we can't divorce that from all of the primary prevention because we won't we won't get there with screening alone. So I can um, add to that part of our um, colon cancer screening project and our three fires cancer control programs include tobacco cessation and include screening for alcohol use. I mean, because as these are all contributing factors and, and screening for those social determinants of health, those factors that influence, you know, health outcomes are, are truly very important. It goes beyond just getting them in the door to get that screening kit, but understanding their lifestyle and their needs and social factors at home. Well, you know, I think it's vitally important. I, you know, again, we are diagnosed so late stage in most of our cancers that it makes our treatment either not possible or it is very, I call it severe because you're in later stages. Um, I will even say from a surgeon's point of view, um, resecting something that's in a stage one or two even, uh, it is a much better procedure, a much better recovery for the patient. And of course, the um, response rate is much better at that point. So screening is it. I mean, I, you know, I'm a big believer that this whole country should be built on public health. And to me, public health is kind of everything. So I'm advocating for both simultaneously, but part of public health is prevention. And so that's why we're working so much with community-based teams, because that is public health. So getting out there with community-based knowledge, getting people screened so it becomes a normal part of their life to get screened um, is what the goal is. It should just be part of how you take care of yourself. But I don't think a lot of people have the opportunity to know what that means, what screening means or how important it is. And so this is a, such a multimodal way of dealing with um, the people that we serve. It's start by let's not get it in the first place. So we look at risk factors that Melissa went through for, for getting cancers that makes it possibly more likely. Then we go to, okay, well, we did get it, but can we just catch it really early? And can mm -hmm. we get it in those stages where we can we could cure it essentially for many of the cancers? And then thirdly, if we don't catch it, can we still get somebody into the system, this complex system, and walk them through it? And so these are all my these are all my jobs, um, which I take very seriously, and and that my teams do out in the field is really work on all those things. And obviously, education's first, tracing risk factors mitigating social determinants of health, all, all baseline equity to me. That is all part of health equity. But the screening is right up there with what public health was made for. How do we look at all of these things and surveil for them and then intervene immediately um, with our community? So um, yeah, everything is screening. It really is. It's just, and, it, and it's that awareness for our patients that we serve. That was some great points from all of you. I'm like, I'm going to put that on a flyer and put it out there and put all of our logos on it. Um, let's go to a question from one of our attendees. It says, for complex care and treatment, does purchase referred care coordinate by geography, by geographic location with the comprehensive cancer centers across the U.S.? It's a great question. 
so I kind of answered that in the Q and A. So I'll just answer it to everybody, which is no, it's fine. I, I love talking about this. Um, so yes, I mean, one of our goals for our cancer group, and this is certainly coordination with everyone that's on this call. You know, I feel like we're all partners in this. Um, we have the knowledge, awareness, um, and we have the bandwidth to definitely really get across uh, Indian country. It is uh, it's getting the regionalization. You know, I hate to make people travel. Dr. Redwood, so your points to me were very poignant. You know, how, why do you have to fly five hours for a colonoscopy? And I haven't solved that yet, but I do understand what that means to our our patients. You know, it is scary enough to talk about screening for cancer or treatment for cancer, but then you have to try to travel, which we know is daunting, especially certain times of the year around the country. I mean, I think you're having some snow up in that upper Midwest. It's pretty severe. Um, and it is the goal to hook all of our regions in with the closest cancer centers. And the other goal is to regionalize care. So maybe one of your bigger service units or a tribal organization is the big center of each of those areas. And we can bring some cancer work in, you know, we can have the, the I want there a familiarity between the staff from the cancer center and the patients that we serve. So it is not, so scary and daunting to go into, say you have to go to the cancer center for treatment, you, you know somebody. Because sending somebody down there to find a place all by themselves and, and maybe not speaking um, uh, English as well or understanding in English. You know, we did a study in Navajo where a lot of people spoke English, but 62% understood instruction and explanations in the native language better. And so that really tells you something right there. They spoke English, but they they understood better in Navajo. And that's what we want to do. We want to speak to them in a way they understand comfortably and the best. So we're trying to regionalize that. We're trying to do more telehealth for follow-ups so they can still be in touch with the cancer center, but not take that trip to go follow up. And then I'm trying to get some of these academic medical centers to commit to maybe bringing staff into a central place in each area that people can come for their appointment. They're still on reservation. They still can bring their families. They don't have to go as far and they still get the same care. So these are all things that are evolving as we work through our, our uh, cancer plan for the um, agency. So thank you so much for that question. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, next question, I will come over to some of the questions we prepared, and I love this one. Um, and you talked a little, I think you all talked about it, but how does culture play a role in data? I don't know if somebody else wants to jump in first, but I can certainly say that um, we, we try and make sure that, you know, we, we have cancer data um, on cancer rates among Alaska Native people going back to 1969. And one of the things we really try and do is make sure that those data aren't just collected for no reason at all, that they're available to be used by communities, by tribal health leadership to make changes. And to be honest, um, my program, our colorectal cancer screening program came straight out of um, uh, the late Dr. Uh, Ann Lanier, who saw that the colorectal cancer rates were higher among Alaska Native people and said that, you know, maybe we should do something about this. And so we often feel that the data leads straight to action. And I feel like that's the best way to um, improve health and support communities is to, to use the data for um, giving it for people to put into policy changes, to put into programming, to lead to new research ideas. And so that that has been a real focus area um, for us. And in terms of the culture, certainly, um, you know, people are very concerned about cancer. And so making the case that cancer prevention, a lot of the traditional activities, um, you know, being outside, picking berries, things that people have been doing for millennia are very healthy and are um, contribute to cancer prevention. And so I think a lot of the the work is is tying that back and really supporting that resiliency.
I want to um, echo what Dr. Redwood said is that being um, purposeful and deliberate in why you're collecting data and then ensuring that the data remains sovereign to the and belongs to the communities. And we put we put a lot of effort towards um, the state and in, in being more inclusive of American Indians and their birthus data. And when they can't, then we do it ourselves. And we have a tribal purpose to toolkit that we um, utilized in 2017, and we're utilizing it again um, in the coming year. And, it, and it's really important to ensure that the populations are adequately represented. And then when we do have this data, really being mindful and thoughtful and, and to ensure that everyone understands the data, right? And understand what the data means because we're not all epidemiologists, we're not all public health specialists. And so when folks see these numbers, we want to ensure that it's in plain language and understandable for everybody. Yeah, for, for us at the IHS, data is, is a constant challenge. Um, as you probably all know, you know, sometimes the data is collected, it is, bit biased the way it's it's connected so for example um say that you are of two ethnicities or races they will tell you well which one do you want to put down so we might miss that data um we know that that a lot of and it absolutely is the right of every single person that we serve to seek care in a private sector we don't get that data because it's not entered into honor of our databases. And, you know, it, it's not that we're trying to track anybody down or anything. It's that we're trying to get a good picture of what we're dealing with. Like, where are, where are the problems? Where are the pockets? Why are they getting so much of X cancer, like colorectal in one region, way more than others? Why are we getting at younger ages in some regions? So that's where data becomes vitally important to how we do our work and where we can focus things. On the other hand, there's a deep respect for culture in the way we describe what we're doing and what it's being used for. And I'm just, I just like to say, it's always transparency. This is what we're doing. We're doing it to help your community. We wanna save lives. We wanna save people's health. But if you don't do that up front, then I think there won't be trust and, and there shouldn't be trust. You know, too much has been done to our population that we need to do it with our population and say, this is how we help each other. This is why we need to know how, you, how people did with treatment, what treatment worked better. You know, we know from studying uh, immunizations that we have found certain formulations don't work well on American Indian Alaska Native patients. And we've been able through some research to prove that and get a better answer to that, a better vaccine, a better um, uh, option for our population. And I think the same is true with cancer. What can we do for our American Indian Alaska Natives to get the best treatments? And for that, we need data. But we need to tell them that. We're all a community. We all help each other. We're, we're all resilient. You know, that resiliency that we have is sharing and taking care of each other as our community. So I, I think all those messages are very, very important when you're looking at um, data and data collection. Thank you. I think, um, you know, thinking about what you've all said, we'll go into this next question, but also thinking about, you know, data isn't, isn't something new to us as Native people, right? We've all been storytellers and just using that information. So I think, again, thank you for what you all shared in that question. Um, this next question makes me really happy, and I think it could also flow into the conversation of data, but as someone who was just accepted into med school, congrats. What can I do to increase screening rates and education about colorectal cancer prevention while in school? Well, since I've been through that path, I will comment on it. <laughs> First of all, congratulations and wishing you well. I think you have a lot more opportunity to do things while you're in school. I don't want you to stop studying. I don't mean that. But I think that, you know, connecting with community um, in a, even if you do some work in the community as a, as a aid or helper to, to um, your local tribal, urban or federal, you can, you can participate. You know, there's a way for you to learn. 
Um, I think it's great to experience public health. And, and you know, the, when I went to school, we didn't have the opportunity. So I'm going to tell you right now, there's opportunities for a MD, MPH, do it you know, take that time to really get the balance of public health. But I think you just connect with the people providing the services where you're in school and say, hey, you know, I think I have this idea or how can I help? Or, you know, is there a place for me to just, you know, I have to study and do my homework, but I want to be able to participate and just keep that connection. You know, medical school is very tough. I'm going to be honest with you. And it takes you away from where you're from sometimes. But that connection back is actually very important to keep. I think it gets you through school. It keeps you connected to who you are. And so I appreciate you asking that. And I encourage you to look for those opportunities. You want to add anything, Beth or Dr. Redwood, to that? No? OK, thank you for that. Um, let's go to one of our questions. Um, That's a good one. What are some easy, tangible ways folks listening can support positive change as we think about colorectal cancer? I don't mean to jump all the time, but <laughs> that's a great <laughs> question. Um, you know what? It, it's conversation. You know, I'm I my theory is if we go educate a community, them telling each other. And then get, I mean, I depend on our elders. I depend on those in the, you know, our community leaders, you know, they'll, they'll push it out for you. They will get out there and tell all of those community members, Hey, this is what I heard. And this is very important to us. They're your best spokespeople. Absolutely. Your best spokespeople that for you to, to transmit a message. And we all know, despite the fact we're all well-natured and we're all well-meaning when someone in your own community shares with you, you trust it you're more comfortable with it. So I think storytelling is important. I think um, finding community leaders and they could be anybody, you know, any, there's some, some, just some leaders in there that are going to say, yeah, we need to do this. And that's where you connect with and you really depend on them to spread it around their community. So I think that's one really great way to get the word out. And if they have a story of something they went through, it'd be great if we can get them because we know we're great with, with, oral history and storytelling. And I think it's extremely impactful. So I think that's what we, we could do at that level that would help each other. I want to um, mimic what Dr. Christensen said is that um, the trusted messengers in these communities, and if you have the opportunity to record them and share those stories is really important. And and just using plain language that comes with these stories is is really the key to getting these messages about prevention and screening out to the communities. And I think there's little things that the health system can also do. I, I'm thinking, um, you know, we we send after people get colonoscopies, they get their letter saying, you know, congratulations, everything's normal. See you in 10 years. And we added a line saying, you know, please encourage your friends and family to also get screened and let them know about your screening experience. And even just like kind of building it into all of the little ways. We've definitely done some campaigns where we've had people who have gotten screened, you know, have been willing to have their pictures taken and, you know, say, you know, I've, I've done it and you can too. And so seeing people that you know from the clinic or who are around town that to see their picture really makes a difference. I, I will admit, uh, once I got a colonoscopy, when I came of age, I have told people about it because I think it is important to just, you know, have that that conversation. I've also done the FIT test. I've also done a Cologuard, you know, just letting people know that these tests, uh, you know, we do a lot of things for prevention and that should be just part of our lives. And it's a great way to prevent cancer. It doesn't have to be um, a scary thing. It can be really proactive and, and healthy. So I think that but the ways in which we can build it into our systems can really help. Um, you know, if somebody, uh, we, we had an early colorectal cancer survivor who um, spoke as a, as a, on a patient testimonial panel for a symposium we had. And, you know, he, he and his brother are both um, have, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of 
uh, story and and information and we put them in touch with people from American Cancer Society and um, ended up you know going to Washington DC uh, to as part of the advocacy for um, increasing um, awareness of early onset colorectal cancer and just seeing a picture of him and his wife standing in front of the National Monument with all the blue flags spread out I think you know having those and and he's been putting on his Facebook and and so I think that having a lot of those engaging interactions with people really makes that difference. Um, thank you for sharing that. I think um, all of you, I, one thing that was coming to mind was like Native people love Facebook. And I think about like what you were sharing, Dr. Redwood, and to write that experience, being able to ha share that, because I know for me, again, the prep was putting me off and I didn't want to do it, but having so many people comment on my post just made it comforting. Like, yeah, it's going to be hard, but do it. And I was like, I can't, <laughs> but to get that result right away, I think too made a difference versus like, right. If there was something. So I think there's opportunity there for again, collaboration. Um, I don't, did I want to bring this next question from Don Haverkamp. I don't know if you all saw that one. He placed the link. Um, to a new IHS screening recommendation. Um, it shows a spreadsheet that recommending CRC screening to begin at age 40. He wants to know if there's any comments on that recommendation. It seems to be in line with what is being done in Alaska. So I guess maybe that's pointed more at Beth and Dr. C. Well, since I'm the one that sent those screenings out, of course I'm in favor of them. <laughs> That he he's a great member of our team, and I appreciate um, the work Don's done. Um, we what we did is we took all of everybody's recommendations and put them on the same spreadsheet. So it it is just showing the difference between American Cancer Society, everybody on there. But we really looked at the ages that we're getting cases of breast cancer, of of colon cancer, and we said, you know, we want to be more better. We want to get out sooner and get start people screening. And um, so for us, I think it's the right thing to do. It is for the American Indian Alaska population. We talked to all of our clinical consultants. We got a lot of feedback. Um, and for us in those with the opportunity to catch things very early stage or you know, in a preventive state, I think it's totally worth making some changes in the screening. Um, I'm not saying anybody's screening's wrong. I totally respect all the institutions that set these, but that's not our population. And you know, I have said over and over again, nothing about us without us. And this includes this too. We have to be there. We have to get people going. We have to make sure that screening and prevention becomes part of normal life, that like your checkup and everything. So we took this bold move and we put it out there to Indian country to say, this is what we believe will will prevent more disease. So that was our thought behind behind what we did. Thanks. I applaud IHS for putting that out there because general population data, you it it's it's general. It's generalized and we know that there is um a colon cancer disparity across the Indian country and and we see it and it's documented and we need to support it by changing the screening ages and really lifting people up into a space where they can prevent it and live a long, enduring life. I love that. Thank you. Um, I also have a basketball in the background, so I apologize. <laughs> um, I have some two more questions, and then I think we will kind of close up. I know we're coming towards the time. Um, so in your opinion, what steps can our leaders take to move the needle with and for indigenous communities to reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer in our communities? That's a long question. So let me know if you want me to repeat it. <laughs> I get a lot of requests for funding for screening and funding for diagnostic. And we have a lot of uninsured patients. We have a lot of underinsured patients. I'm working with someone right now who has a $6,000 deductible for a diagnostic screening, a diagnostic colonoscopy. And they're talking about not getting it because they can't afford, like 
screening is preventative. Treating cancer costs a lot of money. So let leadership needs to make screening a priority and that should be a no cost, whether it's screening or diagnostic, there should be no exorbitant cost levied upon anyone in the in our country. So I'll keep my mouth. <laughs> And I'll, I'll yeah, I, I agree. And I'll expand upon that. I was very excited recently to see some of the um, national CMS coverage for uh, patient navigation for oncology. I think that's a really important step that, you know, we know patient navigation is extremely effective for getting people to services. And so um, I think it's a great first step. I would like to see that expanded beyond oncology to, you know, start with the screening um, patient navigation. But I agree, you know, having the funding to make the the work happen and and help patients get get you know, screening, diagnostics, treatment, all of the above. In fact, you know, you, you can't offer screening without having access to some of those other things that, you know, would, well, why would you do that? That that wouldn't be ethical. So we always have to have systems in place that we can support people. Um, and, you know, and again, I, 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 speak to my context in Alaska, that also means plane flights. It also means hotel and, and food to travel in to if you need a diagnostic colonoscopy. So, you know, all of the things that are involved. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of work that's being done, um, really innovative things around bundling care. So, you know, we sometimes joke, you know, you come in for your eye appointment, do you want to get a colonoscopy at the same time? So, you know, certainly trying to do things where we are using resources and um, and uh, healthcare uh, effectively and efficiently. And so we do try and do a lot of that to uh, make it so that people can get all of the care they need when they need it. Yeah, for, for us at IHS and actually the, you know, any of our, um... Our tribal partners are always welcome to use our, P our PRC medical priorities. We share it with everybody. But for us as an agency, it was way past time to equate prevention with any other care that's given as a, as a, as a core right as a human being to have access to prevention, rehab, you know, um, really expanded access to all kinds of rehabilitative type work in all realms. So for us, that was our commitment. Um, you know, of course, we are... We're supported by our director in that realm to get the care out to everybody, to create equity, um, and so this was this was one way we could help with that and support it. Is that now we're we're supporting screening and prevention, not waiting till it becomes something that we have to treat as an urgent matter. So it just it's just rolling out. It'll take a little while to get the traction that we all hope for. Um, and then it takes a lot of education. It just takes a lot of education to tell um, our people that we serve, this is gonna help you. This is gonna prevent you from getting sick. This is how you access it. I know there was a question, uh, Melissa, and that I was reading in the chat is, um, how do we access knowledge about PRC? Well, you, you can ask your local PRC offices, either at the area or the healthcare centers. But it will be, we have a YouTube on this that will be public facing soon. So just kind of keep an eye on the IHS.gov because um, uh, Dr. Clark, who really was the creative mind behind the new PRC, did record everything on YouTube to explain what's available and, and, and uh, working through that. So we're going to make that public facing soon. We're just uh, finishing up some design on that. Um, and then... Yes, our PRC offices, we also have a care team that we're working on that, that coordinates all aspects of care, case management, navigators, PRC staff, to make sure we're getting all the information to the patients through that venue. Um, so we hope to improve communications and, and uh, access to information to all, the, all of the people that we serve. So these are all very, very critical things that we, we are doing right now. Thanks. 
Um, I want to end on this last question as we think about that cancer continuum and getting our relatives screened, right, so we can have more survivors and more folks who are being able to see that early detection gives you more options for treatment. So the question came in of how can we effectively get their survivorship follow-up back to their primary IHS clinic? And I know some of those conversations we've had here too internally with our ACAF staff of ensuring that you know, those that are going out to receive care, how are they following back up? So I'd love to hear your perspective and then we'll kind of close up. Well, I'll go first. For me, if you remember the, the diagram that I showed in the continuum of care, everything is connected. And so two things that I didn't speak about, which I think are vitally important, is caregiver support, respite, able to get information, when they need it about the person they're caring for, because we care for, we care for the, um, our families after this. We don't have home care and everything like you have in urban, suburban areas. This is family. So we're trying to do a lot of support for family caregiving, but we also, survivorship is something that we need to do better. And part of that will be the navigators bringing them back in and doing that surveillance and the survivorship, you know, what complications from care did you have? side effects from, you know, chemotherapy or other treatments. Um, and so that is part of the whole continuum that this plan is going to address is that, that we know that's something that we want to make more prominent and more accessible to people. So that's why we're so happy to be starting these navigator trainings, because we want to say, hey, this is a whole cycle. We just don't say, oh, they're done. Great. No, we have to get them back and make sure that that survivorship is, is done at the local level back with their primary care or whoever's providing their care where they're comfortable and they have that trust. So great question and, and really very important. Yeah, I, I would say um, part of the issue is sometimes our different health systems are on different electronic health record systems and, and that, um, I've definitely seen it where the information doesn't get back to the home um, tribal health organization, especially if somebody got a, you know, a screening done somewhere else or outside of the tribal health system. So we do try, we, a lot of that is updating records. And again, that comes back to patient navigators. Part of the work that they do is making sure the information is correct and um, the care plans are there and the screening, you know, next you know, you need to come back for screening again in a year, um, get your fit in a year or whatever it is, um, that all is really important to keep all of those records connected. And I, I definitely, um, I, I wish there was a universal electronic health record, to be honest, that would, that would really delight me. I know there's been efforts in different places about health information exchanges and that kind of thing. But I, someday I think that, that if we could figure out how to have the information be in the correct place and that you can then act on it, that would really help all of us. So that's an important piece for me. I would, um, echo all of that and um, just highlight that what we've done in some of our um, rural tribal communities is develop survivorship toolkits. And so sitting down with the patient right at diagnosis and ensuring they understand all the resources available in their community and giving them space and an infrastructure to bring information back from their, um, from the regional cancer centers, because some of our folks travel up to four hours for cancer care and ensuring their caregivers are in the room and having that discussion with them and then setting reminders in the electronic health record for the provider to reach back out to the patient on a regular interval is really important. And I think there are a lot of opportunities coming as we modernize the infrastructure of the IHS um, electronic health record system, right? And so that there is that easier interface. But in the meantime, I encourage everyone to reach out to their um, health and human services at their state and see if that information exchange is available. Um, that at least gives you admission and discharge information and will keep you, you know, your smaller tribal health clinics up to date. It is working in Michigan. And so I encourage everyone to 
see if that's available in their state. And I want to have like a 2.0 webinar to talk about caregiver and more survivorship, but um, I know we're at time and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Again, Beth, Dr. C, Dr. Redwood, I thank you, all of us, thank you for your time, everything you've shared with us today. And again, our attendees for engaging with us and asking some really great questions. And again, ACAP staff for helping to put this together. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful, beautiful day. And again, I thank you all for today for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all.